Ladies and gentlemen, say hello to the brand new top dog of War Thunder. Or should I say Top Gun? The F-14A Tomcat has finally arrived and it is here to mop up all of the competition. So strap in as we take a ride down the highway to the danger zone to see what this baby can do. The history of the F-14 can be traced all the way back to the TFX program in the 1960s that would birth the F-111. At the time, newer Soviet bombers, supersonic anti-ship missiles, and fighters were just around the corner and were looking like they'd be too much for the Phantom to handle on the fleet air defense role. So the Navy wanted a new interceptor that could intercept these bombers and anti-ship missiles further away from the fleet than the F-4 could, while still being maneuverable enough to defeat the new generation of Soviet fighters in a dogfight. At the same time, the Air Force was looking for a new long-range tactical bomber to replace the F-105. Secretary of Defense McNamara saw this as a golden opportunity to fill both roles with the same aircraft so that they could share commonality. So on February 14, 1961, he ordered both the Navy and the Air Force to begin the TFX program. The Navy was opposed to it from the start, but were still forced into it regardless. Neither service could agree on a basic set of requirements, and ultimately the design would be based off of mostly the Air Force's requirements. Design requests were sent out, and by December 1962, General Dynamics had been chosen as the main contractor. Since they had no recent experience designing carrier-based aircraft, Grumman was brought in to assist with work on the naval version designated the F-111B. From the start, weight was a major problem, with the base airframe not being able to operate from carriers. In a continuing effort to reduce weight, a weight improvement program, then a super weight improvement program, and finally a colossal weight improvement program were undertaken. Those are the official names, by the way, at least from what I found, so I, I didn't make that up. I'm just wanting to let y'all know that. Even after all of that, the F-111B was still 5,500 pounds over limit for a carrier operations. It would take Congress getting involved by cutting funding to the F-111B program in May 1968 to finally free up the Navy to start pursuing their own design. In July 1968, the Navy put out a request for proposals for their new Naval Fighter Experimental or VFX program. It called for a tandem cockpit twin-engine design capable of Mach 2.2. It also needed to have a weapon load of six AIM-54s or a combination of six AIM-7s and four AIM-9s. General Dynamics, Grumman, Ling Timko Vought, McDonnell Douglas, and N.A. Rockwell all submitted bids, with Grumman emerging the victor in January 1969. The Navy had already contracted Grumman to study improvements and alternatives to the F-111B design back when they were still working on it. From this emerged Design 303E. It would be officially designated F-14 and receive the name Tomcat. The name comes from a combination of Grumman's tradition of naming its planes after felines, as well as to honor Admiral Thomas Connolly, who played a large role in the program. Those working on the program referred to it as Tom's Cat, hence the name Tomcat. The F-14 inherited the AUG-9 AIM-54 combo, the Pratt & Whitney TF-30 engines, and the swing wing design from the F-111B. The Navy wanted to replace the TF-30s with a more powerful engine, but that ended up failing so they were stuck with the TF-30s. The use of already developed systems allowed for a quick development time and the first prototype made its maiden flight on December 21, 1970. With Grumman Chief Test Pilot Robert Smith at the controls and Project Pilot William Miller in the rear cockpit. Despite some early setbacks, flight testing was very successful and the Tomcat was entering the fleet within 17 months of the maiden flight. BF-1 Wolfpack and BF-2 Bounty Hunters were the first squadrons equipped with the F-14 and would soon be using them to fly combat air patrols over the evacuation of Saigon, though it would be some time before the F-14 would see combat. Throughout the 1970s, F-14s would continue to replace the F-4s as the main interceptor of the fleet, and by 1984 they were the main fighter on board all U.S. carriers capable of operating them. Finally, in 1981, the Tomcat would see its first combat. While the USS Nimitz was performing a freedom of navigation exercise in the Gulf of Sidra, a pair of F-14As from VF-41 would be attacked by Libyan Su-22s for violating their claimed territorial waters. At the time, Libya claimed the whole Gulf of Sidra as their territory, even though this extended 200 miles from shore instead of the internationally recognized 12 miles. Once engaged by the Su-22s, the F-14s quickly turned the tables on the pair of attackers and shot both of them down. 
Seven and a half years later, another pair of F-14As, this time from VF-32 aboard USS John F. Kennedy, would be engaged by two Libyan MiG-23s. This played out the same as the first, with both MiGs being splashed. It would be some time until the American F-14s would see combat again. In the meantime, 65 F-14As were upgraded to be able to mount the Tactical Air Reconnaissance Pod System, or TARPS for short. This was so they could take over the tactical reconnaissance role from the aging RF-8Gs. As the 80s rolled on, the Tomcat would make its big screen debut in the 1981 movie The Final Countdown and would become a pop culture icon in the 1986 movie Top Gun. Now we'll leave off here with the American Tomcats and pick back up whenever the future F-14 variants are added. Now let's take a little trip over to the Middle East to a country called Iran. Back in the 1970s, Iran was a major ally of the US and were in the market for a new high-tech fighter capable of intercepting reconnaissance MiG-25s the Russians were flying around the area. They would end up choosing the F-14 in 1974 and placed an order for 80 aircraft, 714 Phoenix missiles, spare parts for 10 years, and technical support. F-14s with downgraded electronics began arriving in 1976, and by the time the Shah was overthrown in 1979, 79 aircraft had been delivered. The Iranian Tomcats would play a major role in the Iran-Iraq War of the 1980s, and this is where most of the F-14's combat record comes from. Numbers from this war are highly debated, but the F-14 was credited with a minimum of at least 60 air victories, and at least 6 F-14s were shot down during the war. The top F-14 aces all come from Iran, with Jalil Zandi being the highest scoring with a confirmed 11 kills. The Phoenix missile would play a key role in the F-14's early dominance in the war, though the limited supply of the missiles would become a problem as the war dragged on. To counteract this, the Iranians would try converting Hawk SAM missiles for air-to-air -air use with mixed success. Lack of spare parts would also hamper the F-14 during the war, with most of the fleet having to be scavenged for parts to keep a smaller number flightworthy. After the war, Iran would continue to use the F-14, and with foreign assistance from Russia, they have managed to still keep a few active even today. In War Thunder, we get an early production version of the F-14A. It is equipped with the AN-AWG-9 radar. This is an extremely powerful and advanced radar able to spot targets over 100 miles away. Currently, the largest maps are only about three quarters of that, so if there's an enemy in front of you, this radar will be able to find it. You have six different range settings you can choose from, those being 6 miles, 11 miles, 23 miles, 57 miles, 115 miles, and finally 230 miles. I tend to default to the 57 mile range setting myself as that'll cover most maps, but on larger EC maps sometimes I'll use the 115 mile setting. The AUG-9 has four separate search modes you can choose from. Two of those being the familiar Pulse Search and Pulse Doppler Search, the third being PDV or Pulse Doppler Velocity. This works the same as PD, but instead of showing range, it shows how fast someone is closing or extending from you with the notch filter in the middle. And then finally, the brand new Track While Scan or TWS mode. In TWS, the radar will use part of its power for tracking one or more targets, while the other part is used for scanning. When using TWS, you can acquire a sort of soft lock when you select a target. You should then see a partial box form around them, giving you a visual indicator of where they're at. You can then use this TWS lock to guide active radar homing missiles onto them without alerting their RWR. However, since only part of your energy is used for tracking someone, you are not able to guide semi-active radar homing missiles with a TWS lock. Instead, you need to fully lock onto someone to guide a SAR. TWS also displays more information than other search modes as it'll give you a dot with a line coming out of the center called a velocity vector that indicates which way the enemy are flying. You can tell friendlies apart as they'll have a line over their velocity vector. When it comes to scan settings, pulse, pulse doppler, and pulse doppler velocity have access to three. A narrow 20 by five, a medium 80 by five, and then a wide 130 by five. TWS, on the other hand, only has access to a narrow 20x9 or a medium 80x5. The AUG-9 also comes with two different ACM modes. Well, I guess you could technically say three, but the third is a variation on the second. When you first switch to ACM, you will get the familiar boresight mode, which locks anything around your crosshair. 
if you press the radar IRST beyond within visual range combat keybind a second time, you'll switch to the VSL or vertical scan lock on mode. This sets the radar to scan minus 15 degrees to plus 25 degrees about your crosshair. Now if you use the ACM toggle again, you will switch back to the regular search modes. Instead, use the change radar IRST search mode keybind to toggle to the third ACM mode, which is still a VSL mode, but this time you are scanning from plus 15 degrees to plus 55 degrees. This latter VSL mode is known as VSL high, while the former is known as VSL low. Now each ACM mode has a PD and pulse setting though there is a quirk if you're trying to swap between the two. TWS, PD, and PDB all have their own PD ACM mode, so with how Gaijin currently has it coded, when you swap from Pulse to PD and then want to switch back to Pulse, you have to toggle through the three PD versions to get back to it. This can be a little irritating when you're wanting to swap between the two quickly in the middle of a dogfight. While it does have its quirks, and it might not have the narrowest PD filter of all the radars in game, the combination of TWS, Pulse Doppler, and the ability to find targets at long range easily make this the best radar currently in game, in my opinion. Now for defensive avionics, you get the AN ALR 45V radar warning receiver. Nothing really to complain about here, it's a solid RWR like all other American RWRs. So when you get locked, the RWR will show you which way it's coming from. Now, you also get access to six countermeasures after researching the corresponding rank 1 modification. I tend to go with mixed countermeasures as I find the chaff helps to decoy SARS and active radar homing missiles when trying to notch them. Though, in this regard, it's up to your own personal preference how you want to run them. As long as you're not going crazy with their use, you should have enough to last you through most games. When you are attempting to dodge an IR missile, be sure to cut your afterburner as the F-14 has some crazy hot engines. If you don't, the missile's likely to ignore your flares no matter how many you drop and still come straight for you. Lastly, you get a full ballistics computer for all your unguided ordnance. So you have CCIP for bombs, rockets, and guns, as well as CCRP for bombs. Since you have CCRP, you also have the ability to place a speed. The F-14A does get access to the custom weapon loadout system, so you can choose how you want to build your own loadout. I went over how this worked in the A-10 video, but if y'all want, I can make that section its own video. That way, you don't have to dig through that video to find it, and I don't have to explain it every single time. Moving on to air-to-ground weapons, you get access to the full family of Mark 80 series dumb bombs and Zuni unguided rocket pods. With the various ballistics computers, you can be fairly accurate with these unguided weapons. You can carry enough Mark 82 bombs to knock out a single base in about half of a second one if you find the opportunity to go do some bombing at the end of an air RB game. But when it comes to cast and ground RB, the lack of any kind of guided ordnance will make it difficult to deal with enemy SAMs. If you're looking for cast, there are plenty of other options in the American tech tree that are way more suited to this than the F-14. Moving along, let's take a look at the air-to-air -air missiles. This is really where the F-14A shines. You start off with two AIM-90s stock and can mount up to four of them after researching the corresponding rank 1 modification. It's a solid 18G missile with good range, the only downside being is that it is now a caged seeker missile, meaning you can't lead it before launch. The next IR missile you get access to is the AIM-9G at rank 2. You can mount up to four of them and it is a very solid upgrade over the 9D. It retains the same range and G-pull as the 9D while receiving an improved seeker head with a large off bore sight capability allowing you to lead someone before launch and it is capable of radar slaving. The final IR missile you get access to is the AIM-9H at rank 3. Like the previous two, you can mount up to four at a time. This was the first Sidewinder to use solid state electronics in its seeker. All previous Sidewinders used vacuum tubes which suffered reliability problems due to the stress placed on them from the typical hard carrier landings. In War Thunder, it's not that much different from the 9G with the only statistical difference being the higher track rate of the seeker. But in game, this doesn't seem to change much. However, the 9H does seem to have more flare resistance than other IR missiles, though that might also have something to do with mainly fighting F-14s that have a very high IR signature with an afterburner. 
Now you do have a second line of missile modifications that contain semi-active radar homing and active radar homing missiles. This line starts off at rank 2 with the AIM-7E, not the E-2, but just the base E. While you can mount up to 6 of these missiles, I wouldn't bother with this at all as it's really just dead weight at top tier. Since this is the base 7E, you have that 1.8 second track delay after launch that makes it impossible to use in close range snapshots. Personally, I don't bother carrying these and I waited until I got the next modification before carrying the Sparrows. If you do plan to use this missile, it works best if you launch it at someone between 4 to 7 miles away from you. The next Sparrow is the AIM-7F, which you get access to after researching the corresponding Rank 3 modification. This is still a solid medium range missile thanks to its 15 and a half second burn time that lets you regularly reach out and touch people between 10 to 15 miles away. Since it tracks off the rail, it is also a much better close range missile compared to the 7E. It's also gotten even better at close range since I last covered this missile thanks to several rounds of changes to its seeker and guidance behavior. Once you get this missile, this will become your primary weapon for most situations. The final missile available to the F-14A is the AIM-54A Phoenix at rank 4. This is the first active radar homing missile to be added into War Thunder. The Phoenix has its own onboard radar capable of locking onto a target 10 miles away and then guiding itself to intercept. If you launch from within this 10 mile range, the Phoenix is completely fire and forget, but since it only pulls 16 Gs, it's better used at longer ranges. That range greatly depends based on launching conditions. On smaller maps, where you can only climb to about 10,000 feet, you're looking at about 20 to 25 miles max. However, on the larger EC maps, where you're able to climb up to 30,000 feet and get up to speeds of Mach 1.2 before launch, the Phoenix is capable of hitting targets over 50 miles away. It's able to reach these ridiculous ranges thanks to its high top speed of Mach 4.3 at high altitude and its 30 second engine burn time. Another trick it uses to reach those longer ranges of 30 plus miles is that the missile will loft itself to a higher altitude where there is less drag and then when it dives at its target, gravity will help keep more of its energy. That long engine burn time though can also be a double edged sword, as the missile will be marked for enemies that entire time well, at least within a certain render distance. Past that, they will have to spot the smoke trail, which is still very visible on its own. If you're using TWS, you can launch and guide the Phoenix without alerting your target's RWR until they go active. And you're also able to guide multiple missiles onto different targets at the same time. Once you manage to land a hit, you can be sure that your target is dead thanks to the massive 60 kilogram TNT equivalent warhead. If you're trying to defend against the Phoenix, you can either notch its radar by flying perpendicular to it, or you can outmaneuver it. Overall, this isn't the wonder weapon that kills everything that some people were afraid it might be, but it's not useless either. It's a very good weapon that gives the F-14 a unique capability with unheard of range. Next up, we have the gun. The Tomcat is armed with an M61A1 Vulcan 20mm rotary cannon mounted on the left side of the nose with an ammo pool of 676 rounds. With its fire rate of 6000 rounds per minute, you're looking at a trigger time of 6.76 seconds. The Vulcan is the gold standard when it comes to top tier guns, combining a high rate of fire, good ballistics, a large ammo pool, and good damage to boot. This is going to be your main weapon when it comes to close range dogfights and it's not going to let you down. With the weapons out of the way, let's take a look at the stock grind. Like the A10A that I covered last time, the F14A early stock grind is not easy. Since it's an end of the line vehicle, the RP costs are very high and you don't get access to your good all aspect AIM-7F until rank 3. Flight performance wise, you're generally a match for most other planes at this BR even when stock so you're perfectly capable of going after players right after unlocking the plane, though you might want to be a little more passive at first until you unlock the countermeasure modification. When it comes to picking modifications, I'll always suggest getting the countermeasures first. After that, I would suggest getting the 9D before moving on to your rank 2 mods, then get the 9G and 7E, and then your pick between the booster or airframe for your third rank 2 mod. As for your first rank 3 mod, I'd pick up the 7F, no questions. 
For the second, I'd pick up the G-Suit to help limit blackouts, and then the third one's up to you if you want to get the 9H or Wing Repair. Once you get to rank 4, it's time to unlock the Phoenix, and then you can go get the rest of the performance mods before finishing spading the plane by getting the gun and ground on its mods. The F-14A Early is powered by two Pratt & Whitney TF-30 P-412A afterburning turbofan jet engines capable of producing 8,020 kilograms of force in afterburner or 4,860 kilograms of force dry. These two engines are very hungry while in afterburner and will burn through a usual fuel load of 20 to 30 minutes within a couple of minutes. For that reason, I recommend a minimum of 45 minutes of fuel if you don't want to run out in the middle of a dogfight. Personally, I'll sometimes even run up to an hour of fuel as I have managed to run out of gas a couple of times on smaller maps, even with 45 minutes. The acceleration really isn't great on the F-14, I mean it's not terrible, but the TF-30s are definitely underpowered when it comes to moving the F-14 that can have a gross takeoff weight of 70,000 pounds. The base climb rate of 40,000 feet per minute is alright until you start loading missiles onto it, especially the Phoenix. The Phoenix is a very large and chunky missile that uses a large pylon to attach itself to the belly of the plane. All that adds weight and drag, and you will quickly find your climb rate in the low 30,000 feet per minute. However, energy retention in the F-14 is actually very good, and it also gets some good maneuverability. The maneuverability is thanks in part to the swing wing design of the Tomcat that gives it good low speed handling. The wings themselves can sweep between 20 degrees and 68 degrees. While the F-14 is good in the one circle, this plane excels in a two circle rate fight. If you manually set your wings full forward and maintain around 450 knots, the Tomcat will outrate just about anything. The combat flaps are also very strong, being able to be deployed all the way up to Mach 1 without breaking. The wings themselves are also strong, they'll only rip around 840 knots on the deck, which is around Mach 1.3. Though when you are supersonic, be careful when making sudden high G turns, as the wings do like to come off when you do that. Overall, when fully spaded, there isn't much that can hang with an F-14 in a dogfight. When it comes to playing the Tomcat, I tend to stick with a mixed loadout of Sidewinders, Sparrows, and Phoenixes. For smaller maps, I go with 4 Sparrows, 2 Winders, and 2 Phoenixes. While on EC maps, I go the other way around with 2 Sparrows, 2 Winders, and 4 Phoenixes. During takeoff, I'll set my wings full forward with manual control and then turn it back to auto. That way, if I get into a dogfight, all I have to do is switch back to manual controls and my wings will automatically sweep full forward, since it remembers your last manual setting. I'll also switch my radar to TWS mode. This is my main radar mode, despite it having a narrow search area compared to the other modes. Now if you've been watching my radar screen, you will have noticed that I've started using the manual target selection controls. Those being the horizontal and vertical radar IRST target queue control axes. If you want to use this, be sure to go into the options menu and turn off the toggle for the target cyclic switching of aircraft radar option. This will switch you between the automatic and manual modes. I also suggest going into the access controls of each setting to turn on the relative control setting. This will make it so your selector doesn't snap back to the middle as soon as you let go of the keybind. After you've got all of this set up, you should see two parallel lines in the middle of your radar screen. Using those axis keybinds we just set, we can then move the selector around, and by placing a radar contact in the middle of it, you will select him, and you can then use your radar lock keybind to lock him in a single target track. I find this much easier to select which target I want to use a Phoenix on compared to the automatic system I've been using up until now. With that out of the way, back to what I do after takeoff. On smaller maps I like to climb to about 10,000 feet, and on EC maps I'll try to get up to between 20 to 30,000 feet. I'll be looking for targets early on that I can get my Phoenixes off at. On smaller maps I want to get both of them off right away, while on EC maps I don't mind holding on to a few Phoenixes. Once I launch them, I'll guide them until they go pitbull, and then I'll turn around and fly back towards my friendlies while I let my phoenixes guide themselves. With some luck, you'll be able to knock out a few enemies early on. 
Once I know I've got no one tailing me, I'll turn around and look for targets I can go after with my sparrows while keeping my speed up and helping friendlies. Be sure to use your ACM modes to block up close range targets for your sparrows. As always, you want to avoid getting dragged into a dogfight through the early and mid game, though as the game drags on, it is alright to get into a dogfight if you can isolate a 1v1 or you've got a bunch of friendlies that can back you up. If you get into a dogfight, be sure to swing your wings full forward for maximum maneuverability. If you're in the one circle, you can use your combat flaps to tighten that turn just that little bit more, but if you're in a rate fight, don't use them so you can maintain your speed. And for a dogfight, that's about it. There's really nothing too complex when it comes to dogfighting with the F-14. Moving along to the economy, the F-14 is a rank 7 BR 11.3 that currently sits at the end of the US Navy line. It takes 400,000 RP to research and 1.08 million SL to purchase. Crew training will cost you an additional 310,000 SL. Expert is another 1.08 million SL on top of that. And the ace qualification will cost you either 3,200 GE or you can acquire it for free by grinding out 1.21 million RP with the Tomcat. To fully spade the Tomcat will cost you 514,000 RP and 467,000 SL. If you want to put a talisman on the F-14, that'll cost you 3,000 GE. When it comes to modifiers, the Tomcat has an RP modifier of 2.44 and an SL modifier of 2.7. Both of these are slightly higher than the average for an 11.3, which helps make up for its higher repair cost of 15,164 SL in RB when fully spaded. The F-14A currently has five skins available at the moment. The standard camo is the VF-1 Wolfpack Library. It's pretty good as far as stock skins go, and I also like it for the fact it's a historical skin based off of one of the first squadrons to use the F-14. The second camo uses several shades of blue and white that try to break up the silhouette of the plane. It looks alright, and you can get it for free by getting 174 kills in RB. The third skin is based off the VF-33 Starfighters library. The lightning stripe down the side is very nice, but what I really like about this skin is that rudder decal. I think that gold lightning bolt through the star with a black background just looks really good. If you want to get this skin, it'll cost you 200 GE. The fourth skin is another free one that requires you to get 250 kills in RB. This one is based off the VF-2 Bounty Hunters library, so this is the other squadron alongside VF-1 that first flew the F-14 Tomcat. Out of all of the in-game skins, this is probably my favorite. The fifth and final skin is a marketplace skin currently going for between a buck fifty and a buck seventy, as of the making of this video. I mean, this skin looks alright. The main draw for it is the fact that it's based off the library of VF-32 the squadron that took part in the second Gulf of Sidra incident. As always, there's also the path of user skins from War Thunder Live if none of these caught your eye. I'll leave links to the user skins I was using in the video if you're interested, so go ahead and go check them out. Now let's move on into the cockpit. I've taken this out into sim and it's definitely a fun cockpit to fly from. You have excellent visibility to the front, sides, top, and some decent visibility behind you as well, but Jester does get in the way a bit. Still, a lot better than the F-4s the US previously had. Now I'll show you around the instrument panel, starting off at the bottom left and going from left to right. First we have an indicator that combines the flaps, gear, and speed brake and shows you their current position. Moving to the right, we have several small dials. The top dials show which afterburner zone you are in, though currently this doesn't seem to work as it just goes straight from 0 to 5 with no midground. You can actually enter a sort of low stage afterburner by setting your mouse wheel to throttle and scrolling it up one click from 100%. This low stage burner will consume gas slightly slower than full on afterburner will, so it's a nice in between if you want a mix of power and fuel economy. Below that we have our engine oil pressure gauges and below those are the hydraulic pressure gauges. To the right, we have three tape gauges. On the left is our engine RPM gauge. The middle is the engine temp gauge. And the right is the fuel flow gauge. But this last one doesn't work at the moment. Moving to the top left panel, we have a radar altimeter on the bottom left. And to the right of that is our barometric altimeter. 
Above that is our speedometer that combines knots and mock. To the left of that we have our rate of climb indicator. Moving to the center, we have two screens. The top screen is called the Vertical Display Indicator, or VDI for short. In game, this really only acts as a pitch ladder. You do have a helpful compass on the top which can come in handy when calling out target bearings in sim, but other than that, there is not much use for this screen. The bottom screen is called the Horizontal Situation Display, or HSD for short. This is your radar screen. Oh, and if you were wondering why the background is pure black, that's more a nod to the actual F-14's radar as it had a black backdrop like this. You can also display your RWR on this screen by using the Switch MFD Mode Second keybind. This is actually the only way to see the RWR in the cockpit if you take off the HUD overlay as there is no dedicated RWR display. Moving to the bottom right panel, we have the fuel gauge, which currently doesn't work, a clock in the bottom right, and an oxygen gauge above that, which also doesn't work, or at least I've never noticed it move. Moving to the top right panel, we have a compass in the bottom left, a backup pitch ladder above that, and then a G gauge on the top right. There are also two radio frequency indicators, but since we don't have radios in War Thunder, these don't actually work either. Now moving up to the weapons panel, there are three things to take note of here. On the right, we have our wing sweep angle indicator, in the middle is your slip and turn indicator, and then on the left we have an AOA indicator. Fun little thing to notice about this panel is that the master arm switch is currently in the safe position, so technically we shouldn't be able to fire any weapons in the F-14. Before we take a look at the HUD, I do want to point out that the approach indexer on the left does actually work. This lets you know when you are at the optimum airspeed in AOA for landings. I'll throw up a little pop-up here to show you how to read it. As for the HUD itself, it's actually pretty plain. We have a pitch ladder that goes in increments of 30 degrees, and then in the center we have two crosshairs. The small one is a fixed crosshair and is basically like the crosshair in RB we have, so this will be what you aim with if you don't have a radar lock. Also, if you're trying to get an AIM-9 to lock on, this is what you use to aim with. The moving one is the gyroscopic crosshair and will be what you use if you've got a radar lock as it will lead the target on its own. Though keep in mind since this is a war thunder, no radar gun sight is actually 100% accurate. Now that G you see on the bottom stands for gun and the six below it lets you know how many hundreds of rounds you have left. In this case we still have above 600. Now I could have sworn they had the abbreviations for the current missile you had turned on show up here, but I think they might have taken it off for some reason. If they ever do add them back, SW stands for Sidewinder, SP is Sparrow, and PH is Phoenix. Again, the number underneath them will let you know how many of each missile you have left. When you radar lock someone, you'll also notice two new gauges show up on the sides of the HUD. The one on the left is for rate of closure, but currently doesn't seem to work. The one on the right does work, however, and shows you the distance to the target. You also get separate HUD modes for your different ballistics computers. If you use the switch sight mode in cockpit keybind, you can cycle through them. You should notice that the pitch ladder changes from every 30 degrees to every 5 degrees now, a compass appears in the top of the HUD, and an altimeter will appear on the right. Now the gyroscopic sight will be what you use to aim with, if you're using CCIP that is. Overall, a nice and simple to understand HUD. Probably the biggest problem I have with this is the lack of a speedometer for you to see. Alright, another long one, but it's finally time to wrap things up with the pros and cons and then end with my final thoughts. Starting with the pros, the radar. The AUG-9 has everything you want from a radar and then some. Though it has some quirks, it is easily the best radar in the game. The missiles the Tomcat carries are amazing. You get the solid G and H Navy Sidewinders, one of the best SARS with the 7F, and the first active radar homing missile with the mighty AIM-54 Phoenix. The maneuverability on the F-14 is also pretty good. It is an amazing rate fighter and it is crazy how fast it will turn at 450 knots. Even outside a rate fight, you've got the maneuverability to win most dogfights against other jets. And the last one, how can you hate a movie star? The Tomcat has definitely gained a cool factor after starring in so many blockbuster action movies, and now we finally get to fly it. Moving on over to the cons, we'll start off with the acceleration. 
The TF-30s are definitely underpowered for how heavy the Tomcat is, so the acceleration is going to suffer. Just be mindful of your energy state whenever you're out in game. Next up, the F-14 is definitely big and chunky, weighing in at over 70,000 pounds. But she has to be this big to be able to carry six of the large Phoenix missiles. Overall, this just makes her a very big target for enemies to shoot at. Oh boy, these TF-30s are some of the most gas-hungry engines in the game when in Afterburner. Thankfully, the Tomcat can carry 16,000 pounds of gas internally, so you should have enough to last most games. And finally is the Matchmaker. Currently, the Matchmaker is pitting US against US, and I don't expect this to change at least until the next patch, so you'll end up fighting a lot of other Tomcats. Personally, I've been enjoying it since you've been able to joust with Phoenix missiles, but I know others hate fighting a copy of yourself. Moving on to my final thoughts, the F-14A has pretty easily come in and taken over top tier. Being the first fourth generation fighter in game, it represents a huge step forward in technology and capability that the other jets just can't hope to match. It currently rules BBR with the Phoenixes and 7Fs combined with the Aug 9s TWS, and it outclasses pretty much everything else in a dogfight. This is definitely the F-14's patch, though we'll have to wait and see if she keeps her crown once 2.19 rolls around. A little bit of channel admin at the end, and holy cow, the missile tutorial blew up way more than I was expecting it to. I mean, like, really, thanks a lot, everyone who ended up watching that. I've tried to answer everyone who did ask questions in the video, so hopefully that helped clear up anything that wasn't clear in the video. Also, big thanks to everyone who subbed. I've jumped up over 100 in just a single week, which I just think is crazy. If this keeps up, I'll have to think of what I'm going to do when I finally hit 1k. Though I do have a few ideas already. In the meantime, I'll try to keep on making informative videos like this, so stay tuned for that. Next up is the long-awaited radar tutorial that I've been meaning to do since the first missile tutorial. Until then, tell me what y'all think of the Tomcat in the comments, and as always, thanks for watching, and I hope y'all have a wonderful day.